Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena for yet more DIY fun. For the next month or so, we're switching back into DIY mode. It's been almost a year since we left Denmark and things here aboard the boat are starting to fail left and right. We have a busted fuel pump on our Jenny, we have issues with our pressurized water and we have a leaky chain plate, just to name a few. I also have a long list of improvements that I'd like to make, like for instance installing the last bit of trim in the forward cabin and also so, for instance, installing a pot holder on our stove here and a backsplash. My name is Mess, this is my wife Ava. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Warrior 38 named Athena. That was a DIY fun packed adventure complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, rebuilding the entire deck, gutting and subsequently rebuilding most of the interior, painting the top sides and a ton of other projects. The summer of 2021 we started cruising full time. Now we're finally ready to begin our adventure. Ava is with her family in Michigan for the birth of her sister's first child, so I'll be all on my own here aboard Athena for the next month or so. My goal is to get as much checked off of our to-do list as I possibly can. The end goal with that list is to get Athena ready for our upcoming Atlantic crossing in December. As is customary, I'm gonna set up a little scrum board here so you guys can keep track of the progress. And we have a good assortment of tasks here. Not all of them is gonna merit a lot of time on video, like for instance, how much do you really want to hear about the leaky chain plate? But uh, I know a lot of you guys are curious to see what systems would fail first aboard the boat and also just like the general maintenance while cruising. So I'll be sure to include some of that in addition to the improvements we want to make. This is the list as it looks right now. I am sure there's one or two tasks I forgot to put on here, but we can always add more later and reprioritize. Today I want to get started on the pressurized water pump and the clean water tank tasks. To give myself a little bit more space to move around and store stuff on, I'm also gonna get started on this fix saloon table task. This will also make it easier to film inside of our water tank in case there's something nasty growing in there that I wanna show you. Our saloon table has this telescoping leg below it that allows us to drop down the table so we can have a big lounging area. But the tabletop has developed a bit of a wobble and that wobble is between the top plate of the telescoping leg and the telescoping leg itself. After having removed the wood portion of the table, here's a much better look at the wobble. I hope the threads inside of here are not damaged so it is just going to be a matter of retightening these and then when I reinstall the wood part we'll just add a little bit of Loctite and hopefully, yeah, that should permanently fix the issue. The reason I want to open up our water tank is because our water has developed a slight smell of something nasty. Now I've picked up one of these tank cleaning products at the local chandlery, but before I add that I just want to take a look in here and make sure we don't have an entire forest of stuff growing in there. I'm delighted to report that this thing is absolutely squeaky clean. We do have that faint smell, so I still want to add that tank cleaner. But before I do that, there's something very important I need to do. I've turned off the auto flush on our water maker because that takes water from our fresh water tank and pushes it through the membranes. Now I don't know exactly what's in that tank cleaner, but I'm pretty sure the membranes are not going to be enjoying that cocktail. I've never used this stuff before, so I have no idea if it's any good, but it does claim to remove tastes and odors, which is exactly what we're trying to achieve. And according to the instructions, we need about 200 milliliters for our tank. We're supposed to leave this stuff sitting for 2 to 12 hours in the tank, but uh, we might as well go for 12 hours to get the full Monty. Now I want to get this stuff circulated throughout all of the plumbing also, and that brings us to our issue with our pressurized water pump. Whenever we open a tab, after a little bit, the water starts to pulsate, so like that. 
I believe the most likely culprit here is our pressure tank. The pressure in that has maybe well, leaked or whatever, it's dropped at least. And I think that's why we see that fluctuating. And I think that's also why we don't get water out of the faucet as soon as we open the faucet. There's a split second delay there. If the pressure tank is the culprit, fortunately it is an easy fix. We can diagnose it with a pressure gauge and fix it with a bicycle pump. Let's see here. Oh. Or, <laughs> or it could also be another issue, and that is that the pressure tank is filled with water. These pressure tanks, they typically have a bladder inside of them that's filled with air. In our case, our bladder seems to have uh, developed a bit of a leak. I think the only way to fix that is to get a new pressure tank. Through a little bit of miraculously good luck, it turns out that the local chandlery had a new accumulator tank or pressure tank in stock, this thing was only 40 pounds, so let's go ahead and get it installed. There's one little thing to be aware of with these pressure tanks. Depending on your water pump, you may have to adjust the pressure in it. As you can see, this one come pre-pressurized to 10 PSI, but down here they mentioned that the pressure in the tank should be 3 PSI below water pump switch cut in. And of course that is easily done with just a little pressure gauge and a bicycle pump. But uh, yeah, this says it's supposed to be pre-pressurized to 10 PSI. It's got three in there. So yeah, maybe it's a good idea always to check these. We're aiming for 22 PSI and we've got 22 and a half. I think that's close enough. It is very tight in here, so uh, I can't really show you what's going on, but it is just a straightforward swapping out of the new one for the old one. Ta-da! The water comes on straight away and there's no more pulsating. I got a little bit impatient and I only left the stuff in the tank and the plumbing for 10 hours. I flushed the tank twice as per the instructions and now there is no more nasty smell to the water, not at all. There's a faint, very, very, very faint chemically smell but I'm assuming that's just because of the cleaner and that's gonna go away. So I'll call that a success. While we're on the topic of things that smell, we've had a diesel leak here in our technical compartment. This is where we've got our genset, our water maker and our hydronic heater. And the fuel pump for our genset unfortunately has failed. It's failed in kind of an interesting way because the genset still works, the diesel pump just leaks a bunch of diesel. And uh, yeah, it looks like there's some corrosion on it here. I've got a new fuel pump ready to be installed, but first there's a bit of cleanup to take care of in here. At the local chandlery, I picked up a spray bottle of EcoWorks Bilge Cleaner. I've never used this stuff before, but I figured a bilge cleaner must be pretty good at dissolving diesel. Die, smelly diesel, die. Unfortunately, I didn't find the leak until the fuel pump had filled that compartment back there all the way up. So the diesel ran into this compartment and had filled this compartment about halfway up. I think there was about 20 liters of diesel here. That really sucks. But this stuff does seem to do a good job of getting rid of the smell and the grease. I'll let those two compartments dry out overnight and then tomorrow we can install the brand new fuel pump. There's one more little thing I'd like to take care of tonight. Yoink! Boop. Boop. And the last one. With the table fixed, we can go ahead and close that task. The pressurized water pump is also up and running again and the tank is clean. And we have started cleaning out the diesel so we can replace the fuel pump tomorrow. Swapping out the fuel pump was a straightforward one-to-one -one swap, just as with the accumulator tank. After having thoroughly secured the pump as high as possible inside of the little compartment, I did a quick test to see if there were any other leaks by running the genset for a few minutes. To celebrate the success of yet again being leak free, I did a quick visual inspection of the genset and checked fluid levels. This is the old fuel pump and as you can see there is quite a lot of corrosion on one side of it. That doesn't just happen on its own and I think this is my fault. Last year when we were getting ready to leave Denmark there was a lot going on and in all of that confusion I forgot to mount the little fuel pump up high in the compartment so it's left sitting on the side of the hull and I think we must have had some condensation or something in there to cause that corrosion. So yeah the failure of the fuel pump is 100% my fault. The good news is that we yet again have a functional genset. 
everything I've done up until now has all been routine maintenance type stuff or stuff that's failed over the last year. The last item in those two categories is this one, the leaky chain plate. Everything else on my list here are improvements. So let's get that last maintenance task out of the way before we can get to the fun stuff. First things first, I marked the tension on the turnbuckle with a bit of tape to be able to know how much to tension the shroud when I'm done sealing the chain plate. The cover plate for Athena's chain plates are through bolted through the deck. I did that to be able to drill, fill and drill the holes, meaning not only is the hole for the chain plate itself completely sealed from the core in the deck, so are the holes for the fasteners that secure the cover plate. Using my trusty flat-headed multi-tool, I removed the bulk of the butyl tape and then dissolved the last bit with white spirits. The threads and the fasteners were also easily cleaned with a little bit of white spirits. Then it was just a matter of packing the recessed area around the chain plate with plenty of butyl, covering the bottom of the chain plate and then smushing everything together. After having tightened the two cover plate fasteners, there was plenty of squeeze out. This looks very promising. I was dreading that chain plate task, so I'm glad that's over. Not because it's a bad job or it's difficult to do, it's just a little bit fiddly when you're only one person. Because one of the big things with butyl is you don't want the fastener to rotate when you're turning the nut after you've applied butyl to the bottom of that cover plate, because that can kind of pull on the butyl so you end up with a leak. Now the way I get around that, if you may have spotted in the video, is to use a pair of vice grip and some tape to just hold that fastener in place while I'm turning the nut. Like I said, a little bit fiddly, but it works. So oh, that's another task that bites the dust. Next up, I'm not entirely sure which one to get started on. I think it's gonna get overcast tomorrow, so that might be a good day to start painting the doors and stuff like that. So today, why don't we work on the trim in the forward cabin? That is this guy right here, yoink. Super quick rewind time. Back in January, we stayed in Chichester for two weeks. When we were there, we met James and we used his amazing workshop to make all kinds of cool stuff, like new companionway doors, Ava made her super spiffy spice rack, and we also made a whole bunch of trim. The three pieces of trim we've got here are all straight out of James's workshop. I'm particularly fond of this curved bit here, which was a lot of fun and also a little bit terrifying to make, but the, all of these are for the forward cabin. They're gonna cover these two exposed plywood edges here and the curved bit is gonna go up here above the V-berth. Structurally, it's not gonna make any difference, but in terms of looks, it's gonna be a huge step forward. All three pieces of trim will need to be modified. They need to be cut to length and there are some flangey bits I need to remove. There's plenty of opportunity for me to mess this up. Fingers crossed. I don't. The tapping that secures the plywood to the hull adds a few millimeters of thickness. So the first order of the day was to adjust for that. I know an angle grinder doesn't exactly scream high precision work, but for me, the alternative here was a very, very dull chisel. With the high precision adjustments out of the way, the fit was spot on. After having made a slight adjustment to the headliner and taking off about one centimeter of the height and a few more angle grinder adjustments, I had a near perfect fit. I wanted to round over the corners for comfort and also to match the old trim. Unfortunately, my smallest round over bit wasn't small enough. A bit of hand sanding saved having to wait for a new bit. Bam, that looks pretty dang spiffy. I repeated the process for the other vertical trim piece. To fit the curved bit, I had to wrestle quite a bit with the headliner, putting it up and down multiple times. But after much careful measuring and sawing, the third and final piece of trim slid right into place. For the curved piece, I did end up using my roundover bit. It is going to be right in head bumping height for me. And as they say, the bigger the radius, the less the owie. Finally, I used a bit of construction adhesive to glue the curved piece in place. I love my wife very much. And of course, when she's not here, I miss her. Now, having said that, there are certain projects that are easier for me to do when it's just me on the boat, because we don't quite seem to have the same tolerance for oh glorious man glitter. And this project certainly had its fair share of glorious man glitter, but we've got one, two, 
three new pieces of trim in the forward cabin. As you can see, there is quite a bit of color difference between these two pieces of Iruko. This one up here is gonna get a lot darker over the next year or so, so I think they're gonna end up being a fairly close match, but yeah, I think it looks pretty dang spiffy. And the two vertical pieces here also make a big difference and just make the forward cabin seem a little bit more done. We're slowly getting to the point where the last big fiddly job in the forward cabin is the headliner. But that is not on the to-do list for this month, so we can postpone that a little bit. Now it may have looked like it was quick to put up that bit of trim in the forward cabin, but it took an entire day and I am beat. So I'm gonna jump in the shower and de-glitify. That takes care of the trim in the forward cabin. Now it's only been a couple of days since I put these tasks up here. I did mention that I potentially had overlooked something or forgotten a task on the board and indeed that is the case. There's a task here called new lifelines. Those should be in this box and it should be a fairly quick job to get them installed. So let's get this opened up. Ooh, very shiny. Five millimeter stainless steel wire rope. The astute long time viewer will note that before we left Denmark, Ava made these super spiffy Dyneema lifelines for us. And they've been great, except for one little spot right here. The edges and the top holes on our stanchions are pretty sharp. And as you can see here, we've got some chafe going on. It's only in that one little spot where there is an issue. I could try softening the edges on that hole and just splicing a new Dyneema line, but I haven't been able to find the same type of Dyneema line here in the UK. So instead, we're just gonna replace the two top lifelines with the stainless steel version. That way we'll be absolutely sure we won't have to worry about chafe anymore. And uh, well, it's nice not to have to worry about that. I've gone for an option here where there is a removable eye on one end so we can thread the wire through the holes in the stanchions. And then once that's done, we can attach this again and we'll use a bit of line to tighten this with, just as we have today on the Dyneema line. Besides the obvious monetary advantage of not having to buy a turnbuckle for tensioning the lifelines with, there's also an added benefit to using line for tensioning it with. And that is in case you ever need to, for whatever reason, get rid of the lifelines really quick, all you need to do is just cut that line and the lifelines will be loose. I took the tension off of the old lifeline to be able to remove it and then attached the forward end of the new lifeline to the pulpit and ran it through each of the stanchions. When I tried tensioning the new lifeline, it seemed a little bit loose, but acceptable. The port side, however, was way too loose. Ah. <sighs> Every once in a while, I like to refer to myself as Captain Dum Dum, and Captain Dum Dum has certainly made another appearance. I know exactly what I did wrong. I measured on the outside of the stanchions. It is a curved surface, of course, that's gonna give us a longer measurement. And then I only subtracted 30 millimeters for having a bit of a gap to be able to tension the lifelines. Yeah, should probably have bumped that up to 50 or 60 millimeters instead. I removed the two eyes before the Loctite had a chance to do its magic, so uh, at least I won't have to struggle with that. Now it's gonna be easy to fix this. I can either find a rigger that can swage a new fork fitting on the forward end of the lifelines, or if I can't find a rigger, I can use swageless fittings. Now the swageless fittings are more expensive, so I'm gonna see if I can find a rigger first, and if I can't, well, then we'll fall back on the swageless solution. We'll leave the uh, lifeline task in doing, and uh, then I think I will retire to the forward cabin and see if I can just forget about this silly mistake. Now, next week, we're gonna be finally, I hope, painting the doors. That's been on the to-do list for a long time. Also wanna see if I can do a bit of configuration of our Victron Quattro inverter charger so we don't overload the gen set. And uh, yeah, well, we've got a bunch of other cool stuff up there. So I hope to see all of you guys back here at Athena next week for yet more DIY fun. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See you.